welcome back to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. In this episode, we will be talking about the latest episodes of the Exorcist TV series. The first one from a week ago entitled Darling Nikki. And the last one that just came on this past Friday entitled Help Me. I just want to give you my fair warning as always that there will be spoilers in this analysis incorporating both um, information from the original first season and this second season. So if you uh, have not caught up on The Exorcist, you don't want to be spoiled, please feel free to turn this analysis off until you are able to catch up. However, if you don't care about that or if you want to proceed regardless, then let's forge on right ahead. Now, as usual, I will not be talking about every scene in the episode, and I will talk about some scenes out of sequence as they are connected perhaps to others. So let's move forward. We begin by noting, of course, that as the show opens, Andy has now been confronted by the Nikki demon, as I call her. That is the manifestation of his wife that the demon has now taken on in order to fool Andy. We see that Grace is no longer sufficiently luring Andy into the web of deception and action that the demon has ultimately planned for him. So now it has changed tactics and is now using his wife as the means to draw him into its web. It appears that Andy is still trying to come to terms with whether or not this is some type of psych psychological episode or whether or not he's actually seeing his wife. He does say that he thinks he's losing his mind. This, of course, is after Nikki asks him if he is scared, why he keeps pulling away from her. This is supposed to be everything he's ever wanted, and yet he is recoiling from her and acting like he doesn't really want to be in her presence. So the demon uh, perhaps might be wondering, you know, is this is this properly, is this a, a sufficient lure for this individual, for this human creature? Uh, am I doing my job well enough? Do I need to intensify my efforts with him? Anyway, it, naturally he's wondering if these things are just some kind of illusion he's cooked up in his head, and the demon moves forward to try to persuade him that the, it is not and that she is real. We move on from there to see that Marcus uh, and Tomas uh, reunite together after Tomas has left the house. Uh, Tomas comes back after Marcus has been waiting for him apparently for a number of hours. Tomas tells Marcus that he's been back to the house uh, once again defying Marcus's orders and defying his superior wisdom and judgment. And Tomas, uh, in, in his kind of uh, passionate rhetoric, says, I know what you told me, but they're in danger, blah, blah, blah. We need to help them. Uh, Marcus relents once again and says, you know, tell me what you saw. What did your vision show you? And once again, Tomas is actually having a vision right there in front of Marcus as he is telling him about what happened in the house when he went back to it that night. Well, it appears not only, of course, that Tomas is once again defying Marcus and being led once again by his passions rather than his reason, which is very clearly shown in this series, not just from this season, but from the first season, that Tomas is a person who is led by his, his guts. He's led by his gut reactions. He's led by his passion over his reason and over his logic, where Marcus is actually the exact opposite. But it also appears that Tomas's visions are intensifying in their horrific nature. And I think that this is actually part of the design. We know from season one that the Satanic Brotherhood has been after Tomas to get him to join their side. And we know this, that they have been after him for some time. They tried to lure him first with Maria Walters and, and the money that she was going to give him, or that she did give him. Uh, they tried to get him to join them at the Bokari Pulveri, or to join them at, should I say, to join them at the dinner party that Maria Walters was having at her home. And we also know they were expecting him to show up at the Bokari Pulveri ritual that took place in season one's episode entitled Star of the Morning. So it appears that they have been after Tomas for some time, and it seems to me that these visions that Tomas is having are in fact not visions from God. It is not a gift from God. It is in fact a curse 
um, a deception, a trick that has been given to him by the demonic horde in order to gain his trust. And this is something that Tomas, in his passionate nature, does not, and his desire to just kind of push ahead regardless of, heedless of the circumstances, this is something that he does not seem to understand despite the many warnings from Marcus as they have been given to him repeatedly throughout this season. I'm hoping that Tomas does not wind up like maybe like Dol Dolores Navarro has wound up. Uh, a good exorcist, a good servant of God, a, and in Marcus's, uh, Tomas's case, a good priest who happens to take this a little too far, letting these demons again, uh, letting these demons in one too many times, going to the well or going to the precipice one too many times, and and finally getting pushed over the edge, pushed over the edge, and right into the trap that these demons are setting for him, or at least that I believe they are setting for him. And so I'm hoping that Marcus is also not going to start accepting these visions and start using them and letting Tomas use them. I believe that Marcus really needs to rein Tomas in here. He needs to tell him, you need to pull back from this. You need to stop this altogether. I mean, cold turkey. You need to stop letting this happen. Or this ultimatum, in my opinion, needs to be given. I am going to dismiss you from my service. And I am going to dismiss you from the path of being an exorcist because you can't handle it. Okay, so anyway, this is something that I think Marcus has seen about Tomas before. I think he saw it in the first season, but he went ahead and allowed him to join him anyway, and I think you're starting to see some of these kinds of things. They might start to unravel a little bit as this series goes on. So anyway, we move on from there to see Andy and Rose at this uh, kid's psych uh, a psychiatric ward where they're talking to Truck, David, and Rose is trying to find out how he's doing, and, and the kid is basically telling her he doesn't like it there, he wants to go home, and at the same time, you're seeing a very distant Andrew just kind of sitting there with his arms crossed, kind of nonchalant, being very far away, not in the moment, not present with his child to find out what's going on and what's happening with him. Uh, Truck is asking, you know, does Verity hate me? Uh, he wants uh, Rose and, and, and Andrew to tell her that he didn't mean to do anything to her. And then he, of course, asks Andrew, do you hate me? And, and Andrew, again, he's rather nonchalant and distant. And he finally snaps out of whatever, you know, uh, state he's in. And he says, what? No, kid, I don't hate you. But it's pretty clear that he's having some serious doubts, more than likely demonically induced, to... Um, basically distance him from his child and in these events we're starting to see Andy begin to be set up to despair uh, and in his despair to perhaps contemplate extreme solutions to the problem of what is going on with the kind of the breakdown of his family that has started with Truck's actions against Verity, his attack against Verity. Of course this is demonically induced, but we move on from there to see him sitting outside by himself where Rose notices him kind of acting weird as if he's talking to himself from her perspective, but we know of course that he is talking to the demon Nikki who appears to him when he asks her, uh, did you cause Truck to do this? Because Truck told them that a voice inside his head told him to attack Verity and made him do it. And he asked, that is, Andy asks Nikki, did you make David Truck do this? And she says, <laughs> rather nonchalantly and innocently, I didn't do anything. These kids are the way they are, and sometimes they're unfixable. You've tried to do everything in your power to keep this family together. It's not your fault, but sometimes you just have to let things happen the way they happen. This is the path the demon is using to try to get Andy to contemplate, eventually, contemplate an extreme solution to the problem of the breakup of his family. Andy does not want any of his kids to go into state-run facilities because he knows the outcome. He's even looking at it as he's walking through the psychiatric ward and seeing these kids looking like, like they're comatose, they're drugged out, they don't know what's going on, and acting like they don't have a care in the world. And he does not want that to happen to Truck. He doesn't want that to happen to the rest of his kids. And so now he's thinking and he's saying he's seeing things clearly. And he's evaluating the situation very clearly. This is what he says to Rose. And then he's starting to think to himself, what needs to be done? And this is where I think the demon is starting to implant more and more seeds into his head. Perhaps it would be better to try some other solution 
that is an extreme solution to the problem. Maybe that extreme solution might even include killing them. But we move on from there to see that later on as Verity herself confronts Andy about this situation and she tells Andy, look, I don't want to press charges against Truck. It's my fault that he woke up from his sleepwalking and did this. Don't blame him. Can he come home? Andy basically flat out lies to Verity, tells her that Truck did not say anything about her to him at all, and basically tells her that, look, Truck is unfixable. Uh, I can't help him. He's not coming back. We need to focus on the rest of the family and let Truck go. The next thing I want to talk about is Maria Walters being found by Bennett and Mouse. Bennett and Mouse have returned from Belgium. They have found Maria Walters in, in Chicago, Illinois. They have infiltrated her home, and now they are going to confront her in order to gain information about the Satanic Brotherhood. They want to know names, places, positions of authority and power, and where they can find these people so that they can go and take care of them, if you will. The last time we saw Maria Walters, she was in very good health. She did not have any uh, physical problems or ailments, but when we first zero in on this scene, we see a whole bunch of medical equipment being set up in a private space, and then we're panning slowly across this uh, room, and we finally begin to see that it's Maria Walters uh, later on after Bennett and Mouse get inside the room. Now, for those of you who remember the first season, George Walters was Maria Walters' ailing husband who himself was dying from cancer and whom she was having uh, taken care of inside their family home there in Chicago with private nurses and, and, and medical aid. We don't know whether or not George Walters is still alive as of this point. I'm actually speculating that by now he's probably died, especially with now we now know that Maria Walters was suffering from cancer and now she herself is dying and is of course at this point no of no further use to the conspiracy. Now I'm thinking to myself, is this why she was rejected by the demons in the first season? Those of you who remember the episode Three Rooms, remember that Maria Walters uh, was vying to be one of the demonically integrated. And in Star of the Morning, she was not chosen for integration. She was not chosen for integration in Three Rooms. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was also, hmm, was it the Grief Bearers? Well, she was also rejected again. And, uh, Pazuzu, that is, had recaptured Reagan McNeil's body, and she walked in on the Satanic Brotherhood plotting their conspiracy, and she told Maria Walters, you are just too mediocre uh, and lacking in any kind of uh, oomph, I guess you want us, if you will, for us to choose you. You're not going to be one of us ever. And Maria Walters despairs, and she kind of looks at this and kind of a little, uh, you know, face as if, you know, a longing face, why and why and why not me, kind of like a little pouty child being rejected by their peers or something, and she, she looks like she, you know, she, she just is lost at that point. Well, anyway, I'm wondering now, knowing what we know in this season, that Maria Walters also herself had cancer, if this is why she was actually rejected by the demons in Three Rooms. If you recall, in Three Rooms, their brother Simon told Maria Walters that she was going to get due consideration, and he always promised her due consideration. Not that she would be chosen, but that she would receive due consideration. Well, she did, and she was rejected. But as brother Simon has captured both Marcus and Bennett in that scene, in that episode, he cuts both of their arms open and decides to let them bleed out. As he's letting them bleed out, he's also offering them a choice. That choice is, you can accept becoming one of us, one of the demonically integrated, or you can die. One of you ha will make that choice. One of you will become integrated, the other of you will die. Make your decision. Well, we see that the demon is trying very hard when it is summoned from its realm into our realm. It's trying very hard to tempt Father Bennett to become integrated, and this is of course what the integrated Maria Walters says to Father Bennett in this episode, Darling Nikki, you were once considered a match for me, she says to Bennett. And when Bennett finally rejects her in three rooms from season one, 
the demon, it looks like, reluctantly chooses Maria Walters. Rather than be in this, in this realm without any kind of human host, it decides to go ahead and take Maria Walters as its human host. Well, we now know, thanks to this episode, Darling Nikki, why it was so reluctant to do so because Maria Walters was already dying of cancer and it did not want her for that very reason. Now, the other side of this, of course, to me is this. They spent a lot of time building up Maria Walters last season. They spent a lot of time building up her, her showing you her wealth, her position in society as a socialite, her willingness to try to influence the church and to try to influence especially Tomas they spent a lot of time building her up as part of the Satanic Brotherhood. Yet, in this season, they go and kind of just haphazardly, well, I wouldn't say haphazardly, but very quickly, they dismiss her and get rid of her. As we see later on in the scene between her and Bennett and Mouse, Mouse kills her. She shoots Maria Walters in the head. Now, why this happens is because, some reason, for some reason or another, we find out that Mouse has some kind of a past with Marcus uh, and we find this out because the demon actually takes on Marcus's voice in the form of Maria Walters and starts to taunt Mouse by calling her my little church mouse and saying that uh, you know ask ask you know, her ask her why she became an exorcist she's talking to Bennett at this point Maria Walters that is ask her what happened in the Abbey 20 years ago and at this point of course Mouse is continually trying to tell her to shut up stop talking don't say anything else and when the demon continues to go on and on Mouse pulls out a gun and blasts the woman in the head and kills her and of course frees the demonic entity from the body that it no longer has uh, any use for we now need to find out some answers to some things. We At first, when we see Mouse in the previous episodes, I think it's one for sorrow and there but for the grace of God go I, uh, we find out that she knows of Marcus King, or at least we think she knows of Marcus King. We find this out because when Bennett is trying to exercise Dolores Navarro, Dolores Navarro says to him, she's going to find you the old gray lion and the little cub well the she that Dolores Navarro is referring to is Maria Walters but when Bennett tells Mouse that Dolores who, who Dolores Navarro was talking about Mouse says Marcus Keene and she says it as if she has at least heard of Marcus Keene and in this sense and in that scene I got the impression that she had at least heard of Marcus Keene not that she knew him, but that she had heard of him by reputation. And the reason I thought that is because Marcus is, in fact, a very well-known exorcist throughout the community in, in the series timeline. He's not only known to the exorcist community, but he is also very well known to the demonic community themselves, the demonic horde themselves. Why do we know this? Because in some of the very first episodes of season one, Marcus is confronted by a demonically possessed homeless woman on the street and when he confronts her the demon says to him the great Marcus the only one we feared whether or not he's the only one they feared or not the demon still calls him the great Marcus and this implies that the demons have a if you will begrudging respect for Marcus as an adversary of note and worthiness to combat and confront them Okay, You also see this kind of begrudging respect when Dolores Navarro herself refers to Marcus as the old gray lion. A lion is an animal of power and strength and authority in the animal kingdom. So calling him that was not without meaning. Mouse knowing, at least knowing of Marcus King, therefore by reputation, is not necessarily that an unfathomable of a, of a proposition. So when the demonically integrated Maria Walters says to Bennett, ask her what happened in the Abbey 20 years ago and takes on Marcus Keene's voice. Now we begin to see that she didn't just know of Marcus by reputation, she knew of Marcus personally and had had some kind of interaction with him 20 years ago. So now we get the five W's going on here. Who, what, when, where, and why. 
We know the who. It's Marcus and Mouse. We know the when, 20 years ago, and we know the where, at least somewhat, some abbey, some place in the world. But we don't know what happened between Marcus, Keen, and Mouse, and we don't know why whatever happened between Marcus and Mouse took place. So here is yet another mystery to be solved that now has taken place. Uh, and, but now, of course, Mouse has gone off in some kind of spontaneous rampage and shot Maria Walters in the head and, of course, in the process has helped to injure Father Bennett. I want to move on from there to talk about Andy and Rose. In uh, one of the later scenes in the show, Andy and Rose are getting ready to get to the good stuff, that is, to get to the horizontal Hulu, uh, until they are interrupted by a vision that Andy has of Nicole wrapping her demonically demonic hands around Rose's throat while those two are in bed together. Rose asks Andy what's wrong, and the demon comes up and asks, says, yeah, Andy, you know, you get two, getting two girls for the price of one, what's wrong, what are you waiting for? Well, <laughs> under normal circumstances, most men would not be waiting for anything. But these, of course, are not normal circumstances. Now, Andy is backing away from Rose. Rose doesn't see the demon. She doesn't see Nikki, but she just sees Andy acting strange. But we know that Andy is seeing his wife, Nicole, in this demonic form. Her eyes all whited out, floating towards him, it appears. And now getting ready to take full control of him to try to get him to kill Rose right there in the bedroom in that instance. And thereby eliminate at least one of its obstacles to him being under its full domination. This, of course, doesn't uh, happen because uh, as these events are occurring, Harper's mom, Lorraine, has found them, has found the house, and has successfully infiltrated into the house herself to kidnap her daughter and take her with her. Now, how Harper, or should I say, how Lorraine found them, how she escaped custody, I thought she was arrested by the police, maybe she got out, maybe she was released, maybe uh, the demons helped her find her daughter as part of a plan, I don't know what was going on, but whatever, however the circumstances unfolded, Lorraine manages to find Harper, and she is trying to take her away from the household. As this happens, of course, Marcus and Tomas come up into come up and they storm into the house. They find Lorraine trying to kidnap the uh, kidnap her her little girl. They stop her. A fight ensues, and in the process of all this happening, uh, the other kids come out of their rooms. They see you know all this here and see all this commotion going on. Uh, Verity screams out Andy's name, which stops him from killing Rose. Uh, and he runs out into the hallway, still under the control of Nikki, where Tomas and Lorraine are fighting. He picks up the knife Lorraine was going to use to, you know, to try to threaten Harper, if you will, and anybody else. And he stabs Lorraine and impales her from stomach to spleen, it looks like. Or stomach to sternum, I think. He basically guts the woman, okay? And I actually thought at this point we were probably were going to see intestines falling out onto the floor. But, of course, you know, this show is a little bit more censored than that, and that's fine. But he really didn't just stab the woman. He gutted her, seriously. I mean, you think of Rambo or something, okay? And, and one of those big Bowie knives or something. Or, um, you know, one of these big special forces knives or something. Think of one of those. But that's what he did to her. And he did, he did all of this under the control of the demon. After he commits this act of murder, this, I guess you could say, this highest sacrament of evil, which is murder, killing, death, the demon begins to take more and greater control over him. It's almost as if it's taken full control over him at this point. And this is where the battle really begins for Andy's soul and for his consciousness, for his very existence as a human being, as he, the demon has now inculcated itself further and deeper into his mind, and now it's going for, it's going for the gusto, it's going for the full the full enchilada at this point. Andy has committed murder. That, as I said, is one of the highest sacraments of Satanism and uh, demonic control. Death, murder, killing, things of that nature. So, having done this, this is a, a segue, a gateway, for the demon to take on this mantle of control over Andy. And this is where the battle begins for Andy's life.